Dr. Janitha Gray talked about a connection between models in the scientific literature and real data, how these can be combined to advise government agencies about where to better store nuclear waste. A key risk in the storage of nuclear waste is the possibility of contaminating groundwater. To reason about the situation, we'll talk about three topics today. First, a connection between calibration and optimization. Second, how we can optimize functions if we can't differentiate them. And finally, how we might build some intuition around confidence in these calibration schemes that depend on experimental data. So let's start off by talking about the connection between calibration and optimization now. So let's start by thinking about a relationship that you probably already have confidence in. That's that the number of miles you can drive in a vehicle depends on the number of gallons of gas you use. This actually gives a simple linear model, which we can write as follows. The k is a parameter of the model and one that we're probably already familiar with, miles per gallon. So if I wanted to think about what this relationship looked like, it would be pretty easy to draw, right? If I had a high k, I would get a very steep line, whereas if I had a lower k, I would get a shallow line. But suppose I don't actually know k. Maybe I'm interested in learning the number of miles per gallon my car gets. What I might do is I might take some measurements. So for a number of different values of x, that is gallons of gas, I would go drive my car and see how far I was able to get. I would take several measurements of this type, and then I would ask myself, what value of k gives the best possible fit to this real data? Let's zoom in a little bit. We'll look at a small region of the diagram up close. Say we're looking at this region of the diagram. We have three different amounts of gas, and we have the amount we were able to drive. Now, suppose that we fit a model with parameter k, some fixed value, and it looks like this. I'll just label it as f sub k of x in order to remind us that it depends on k. For each xi, the model predicts some value of the number of miles that we can drive. There's a discrepancy between the actual measurement that we took and what the model predicts. If we wanted to write an expression for it, we could just write down the absolute value of the difference between the fitted model prediction for parameter k and the actual observation for that same number of gallons of gas. So this is the error for data point i. And what do we mean when we talk about a good fit to a data set? Well, what we mean is that we'd like the error for every single data point to be small. And in order to force that, we're going to minimize a function that depends on these errors. So the function that we'll minimize is the sum of the squares of the errors. Now that the xi are fixed, there are actual data values. What we're getting is a, a function that depends on our choice of parameter k. This is a function that we'll call the error function. If we find the value of a parameter k that minimizes this error function, we'll say that gives us the best possible fit to the real data. In the case of a single automobile, we have a really simple form of model. Remember that the observed value at xi is now a constant. And since this term is linear in k, this term will be quadratic in k, so that the sum of all the terms is also quadratic in k. So all we have to do is take the derivative of this quadratic function in k, set the derivative equal to 0, and solve for the value of k. And that's going to give us the actual minimizer, the best possible value of the parameter to fit the real data that we've observed. This is a really simple model, and it wasn't that hard to find the best value of k. But suppose that we're dealing with a more complex model. There's some things that could go wrong with this scheme. What if it's not easy to compute the derivative? Maybe even once we have the derivative, it's not so easy to find where the derivative is equal to zero. Mm, third, what if it's the case that the fitted model prediction actually depends on the output of a complex simulation model? If that's the case, we're not going to be able to write down an analytic expression for the model, and thus we won't even be able to write down an analytic expression for the error function. This is going to be a problem, and we're going to need tools that go beyond basic calculus. So if the model is more complex and we can't take a derivative, what tools do we still have? Well, even if we can't differentiate the function, maybe we can evaluate it and use that information to optimize. 
So to make our discussion more concrete, let's take a look at a model that describes the surface of the water table underneath the Earth's surface. The Toth model is a complex model that describes the hydraulic head, which is a measure of pressure, as a function of position, xi and zi. For each location, there's some measure of pressure. We're going to use calibration of this model, aka finding that best parameter value, in order to use measurements of the pressure to learn the value of the parameter c. That parameter c is going to tell us exactly how to compute the distance from the Earth's surface to the water table, which is what we want to know to think about the risk associated with storing nuclear waste. So, just as before, we're going to have some model prediction depending on parameter c and also some inputs. Since the Toth model is a complex model, we'll think of it as a black box. What this means is that we give up the ability to analytically manipulate this model because it's complex, and we just think of it as having an input and outputting a function value. So for the case of the Toth model, the input is the location, xi, zi, and the Toth model transforms this into the output, which depends on model parameter c. So just like with our simple linear model, what we can do is define an error at each data point. That's just, again, the difference between the fitted model prediction, like so, and the actual observed value of the pressure at that data point. Because this data about pressure deep underground is expensive to gather, we're only going to have a small number of data points. So it turns out that when we write out our error function, we only have seven data points available to us. Unlike our previous situation, this term is now the output of a complex black box model. And what that means is that we don't have an analytical expression for it. In other words, this function is not something we're going to be able to differentiate. We do still have the ability to evaluate the function. So let's start with a simple idea about how to optimize. For various values of the parameter c, we'll look at the value of the error function. If we were looking at this diagram, we would say 0 must be the optimal value of the parameter. It appears to give the lowest value of the error function. But there's something that could go wrong here. Okay, we've only looked at the value of the error function at these positions. So what if it turns out that the true error function actually achieves its minimum between two of the places where we computed the value. Maybe we've missed the minimum of the error function entirely. In order to protect against this, what we'll do is we'll add a technique that's known as pattern search. So suppose that as we're evaluating the value of the error function at this regular interval, we find a really nice looking value of the parameter. That is, it has a very low value of the error function. Let's call that parameter value c star. Now, what pattern search does is it says perhaps even better values of the parameter can be found near c star. So we'll go down to c star minus epsilon and up to c star plus epsilon and check the value of the error function at these points. Now, if we check and we find that neither of these values of the error function is better than the one we had at c star, what we'll do is we'll contract our neighborhood that is, shrink our epsilon and search even closer to C star for better values of the parameter. On the other hand, if we repeat this procedure and we do find that one of these values provides a better value of the error function, that now becomes the best value of the parameter we've seen so far. So we'll replace our old C star with this new value. We'll make this the new C star because it's the best value of the parameter we've seen so far. And now repeating these two simple rules shrinking epsilon and replacing c star as we find better values of the parameter, we get what's called a pattern search. And that routine is going to actually converge to a local minimum of the error function. If we start pattern search at a number of different parameter values, we also get some protection against the chance that there's a global minimum far away that we just haven't seen in our search for local minimums. So now that we found the optimal value of the parameter, that is, the value that minimized the error function, how confident should we be in that estimate? How could we build confidence that the estimate of the parameter we're getting is actually robust, both against extreme errors and against natural variation in our measurements? 
Originally, we used this full data set of seven points in the case of our Toth model to calibrate the model. But suppose that we are worried about the fact that there might be an extreme error in one of those data points. What we might do is we might repeat that procedure of defining an error function, finding the minimizer of that error function, and getting an estimate of C. We're going to do that for every subset of size 6 of the data. If we discard one of those data points and we find a very different estimate of C, this might indicate that that data point was sort of out of line with the other data points in our set and potentially contains a suspicious place that we should worry about there being an extreme error. Now, I went ahead and did this for the Toth model, and what I found is that with all seven data points, I got an estimate of the parameter C that was 0 0.028. When I dropped to subsets of six, ignoring one of the data points each time, I found values of 0 0.029, values of 0 0.027, and one value of 0 0.026. But these values are pretty consistent. They're coming from a small range, which gives us some sense of confidence that there's consistency in our data set. Now let's talk about the issue of natural variation in the measurements that we take. So in fact, when we take a measurement, we're not talking about a true value, we're talking about sort of a noisy value. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna think about taking each of these observed measurements and making it the mean of a new distribution. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace this original data point with a set of observations from these distributions. So for example, maybe we get xi hat by taking this sample. So we replace our original data point with an alternate realization of that data point that has a little bit of variation. By doing this for every data point, we get an alternate realization of the data table, which is gonna give us an alternate estimate of the parameter C. If we do this repeatedly, what we're gonna get is actually a distribution of estimates of C. Now there's two things that could happen. Suppose we perform this entire procedure a thousand times, and we look at our distribution of the estimate of C. In one case, that distribution is nice and narrow. So what we're seeing is that our estimate of C is really consistent as we add noise to the data table. On the other hand, maybe we look at that distribution of C and it's really wide. So in other words, when we think about the fact that these data points are actually coming from real experiments, we are coming up with widely different estimates of what the parameter C could be. In this case, we probably need to be pretty careful about how we use that estimate of the parameter. In particular, instead of just reporting an estimate of the parameter C, it would be good to actually report a confidence interval that says something about the range we expect C to be from if we acknowledge the fact that there is some natural variation in these measurements. So this process of trying to give a confidence interval of our estimate of C is a topic that comes under the general area of uncertainty quantification, where we try to understand how certain we are about estimates related to the parameters of these models. Another thing that we might think about when we see a very wide distribution of those estimates of C is whether that original model we chose was actually an appropriate fit for the data. Further, it might be the case that the data that we're using just comes from an insufficiently broad range, okay? So looking at this broad range of estimates of C might lead us to reconsider our fitting procedure. A good command of formal mathematical tools can help us access insights that we can't discover through narrative reasoning alone. If you think about the intricacies of a highly complex coordinated system, for example, the comings and goings of thousands of airplanes through a national network of airports, or the distribution network of an international company that aims to deliver within a few days of an order, all of these complex systems depend crucially on the efforts of optimizers and applied mathematicians. It's true that mathematics can be beautiful for its own sake, but it's also a powerful language to help us describe and understand real-world problems. 